Hello, thank you so much for clicking play. The word has revealed something remarkable to us and I'm so excited to present this lesson to you. Well, as you know, we teach that there are three raptures, the pre-trib rapture of the bride, the mid-trib rapture of the church, and the end of the age rapture of the wheat into the barn, and that's a sideways rapture. And the word just proves this over and over and over again. And I never get tired of showing you this pattern out of the scripture because we can keep our eyes on Jesus and we see him fulfilling this pattern over and over, especially in the gospels. So this is the time to be studying the gospels, bride. You don't need to be looking and focusing on the news. Just read the headlines and you'll understand what's going on. But boy, stay in the so Word. So what you're looking at right now is our basic diagram that we talked about in video 160, the last video, but I've taken a lot off of it and I've put in the basic, the three raptures. And what I have you looking at here is that the pre-true rapture is of the helpmate bride for Jesus who will serve as one with him. And that's the first fruits rapture and that is re represented through the woman who left her stone water pot the woman at the well in john 4 and verse 28 she leaves her water pot and that happened in sychar and the scriptures tell us it was about the sixth hour john 4 6. well then we see at the mid-trib rapture what was the next thing that jesus did what was his next interaction with a person after the woman at the well. Well, we see that a royal official, as the New American Standard Bible describes, so this royal official came to Jesus in Cana, and he was interceding for his son. So we've got a man and his son. Oh, the man-child that's raptured in Revelation 12, five. And the New American Standard, as I says, calls him a royal official. Well, that's because the church is a royal priesthood and he is an official here. And see, the church speaks of government, whereas the bride speaks, as, speaks of intimacy, companionship, one who looks out after the household. David had wives and he had a militarized government. Well, a kingdom is only as strong as their military. And so what we see here through this royal official who interceded for his sick child in John chapter 4 and in verse 46, and we see that happened in Cana, but that's not where the royal official was from. He was asking Jesus to come and heal his son, and Jesus healed him without going down to his son. He just spoke the word, and his son was healed of a fever at the seventh hour. So that is interesting because the woman at the well, Jesus conversed with her at about the sixth hour when she was raptured up, left her stone water pot. And here we see at the seventh hour, the man child, they are healed. Okay, now, and we know that the church is going to replace the wicked rulers, powers, and principalities in the heavenly places. And that's the only replacement theology that should be taught is that the righteous are going to replace the wicked rulers and principalities. Okay, then the next thing we see Jesus do in the book of John is he goes to the pool at Bethesda and it very is clearly showing us that he sought out this man and it was very specific. The man had been ill for 38 years. Jesus heals him. He doesn't even know who Jesus is. Jesus slips off. And then later, Jesus looks for him and finds him in the temple. And so this is happening in John chapter 5, as I said, and it was on the Sabbath and in Jerusalem. And the scriptures tell us that the timing of this was during the Feast of the Jews. That's interesting, isn't it? And what we also notice in this particular situation is after this man's healing from being ill for 38 years, and everybody at the pool was sick and distraught and in bad shape, well, we see that Jesus tells him after his healing, go and sin no more. Hmm. Well, this speaks of the remnant the remnant that will be taken to the barn while the tares are being gathered and burned. And we know that those 
towards the end of the seven year tribulation, well, they're gonna be pretty scuffed up. They're the gleanings, if you're going to speak in agricultural terms. And I don't know if you've ever been to a field and you've seen the, towards the end of the season and there's produce on the ground, bruised, scuffed up. Well, that's how the gleanings are going to be. And so Jesus is going to heal the gleanings and give them extended lifespans because they're going to be taken into the millennial reign of Christ. That's what a barn is for. It's for the seed and the earth is going to be reseeded, repopulated. And our dear subscriber, Robin, posted the most amazing comment after that last video, number 160, and put together a connection that our team had not even spotted. And she recognized that the scriptures go full circle. The seed, the word of God, Jesus was born in a barn. And here we see that as the earth is going to be repopulated, oh, here is seed that will be taken from the barn and used. And now what is so interesting about the 38 years, you know, that was a real head scratcher for us for a while, but we noticed that the only other reference to 38 years in the scriptures comes from Deuteronomy when talking about the generation that did not believe the testimony of Joshua and Caleb when they went into the promised land to check out the beauty of it and the, the abundance of it. That generation believed the other 10 spies who gave a negative report. They did admit the land is beautiful, full of produce. They brought some back, but the 10 said, oh my goodness, there are giants there. We look like grasshoppers in their sight. And indeed they did, that was true, because God's intent was to send the children of Israel into the promised land and replace the giants that were there in Cana, just like, the remnant is going to replace the wicked rulers and powers that are governing on earth right now. So don't be discouraged about this global government because mm, they're going to be replaced by the remnant, the mortal remnant. That's why they remain in their mortal bodies. Whereas the bride and the church, when they're raptured up, they get a glorified body because you need a glorified body to live in heaven, but you need a mortal human body to live on now, earth. Let's get back to that 38 years and the significance of that. So the generation that did not believe Joshua and Caleb, God pronounced judgment on them that for 40 years they would wander in the wilderness and that generation would not go in. However, their children would. And God used that 40 years of judgment for that entire generation to die. Those who were age 20 years old and up. So if they were 19 years old, it was like, whew, I made it, I'm going in. So do you realize that when the nation of Israel went into Cana and actually entered the promised land, there was nobody over the age of 59, except for Joshua and Caleb. Isn't that interesting? Can you imagine living in a world where nobody is 60, age 60 on up? Mm, I think that's really interesting. Okay, so the importance of why Jesus healed the man at the pool of Bethesda after he'd been ill for 38 years is because God was cutting the days short of their judgment. That is what that's teaching us. God did not allow the man to remain in judgment for the full 40 years or he would have died because he was following the type and shadow of the remnant in the wilderness. So that is another reason why God will cut the days short. The days he's cutting short are the days of judgment for the nation of Israel. That's why he's going to snatch them and put them in the barn. So Jesus tells this man at the pool of Bethesda, go and sin no more. Well, he said that because the remnant are going to go into the millennial reign, repopulate the earth, but remember, they'll be in mortal bodies, meaning they're fully capable of sinning. 
The curse is not yet done away with. The curse will still be on the earth, meaning in the flesh, for that thousand year reign. Now, of course, the glorified, raptured bride and church and those who died during the millennial reign will not be able to sin anymore once they step into their eternal body. But those who are living on the earth, they will have the opportunity to sin. So Jesus was telling the remnant, <laughs> you know, all that you went through for that seven year tribulation and especially the time of Jacob's trouble. He's telling them, don't sin anymore or something worse than that is going to happen to you. Okay, now this is really interesting because it gives us extra insight into the woman caught in adultery because once all of her judges who wanted to stone her to death, once they all walked away one by one, Jesus told the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. Well, that reveals to us she is the nation of Israel. She represents the remnant. If Jesus would not have intervened, they would have stoned that woman. They would have pronounced judgment on her. But Jesus, they brought the woman to Jesus. They were trying to trap him. And Jesus set her free from the judgment that the word prescribed for her. And so Jesus told her to go and sin no more. That's because he's speaking now to the remnant. He's speaking to the nation of Israel, those who go into the millennial reign. Isn't that beautiful? So every time we see these prophecies cycle through for the rapture of the bride, the rapture of the church, and then the sideways rapture of the remnant who remain in their mortal bodies, every time we can see this pattern cycle through, God is giving us more details and, and that is so important for us to keep our eyes on Jesus and be able to make these connections. Now, what this whole scene shows us also is that just like Ezekiel was acting out prophecy for his generation and the house of God at the time of Ezekiel, they were supposed to be taking note of this prophet and noticing Oh my goodness, do you see Ezekiel? How long has he been laying on his side like that? Oh man, well, it's been well over a year. Oh, you know what? I remember the day he started. Let me look at the calendar. <gasps> he's been there for 390 days. Oh, watch, he's getting up. Oh, he's just turning over onto his side. Well, then they notice he's been there for 40 days. Now, many of the prophecies Ezekiel was interpreting for the nation of Israel. However, many of the things he was doing and not talking about, God was expecting his people, his household to be taking notice of the prophet and be connecting the dots, be thinking about it, wondering and coming to God, seeking answers. What does this mean? Because remember at one point, God had Ezekiel uh, build an, uh, an image of Jerusalem and the wall around it and make a siege against it. And Ezekiel was instructed to take a jar and fill it with this particular grain and he could only eat so much a day and take another jar, fill it with water. He could only have so much a day. So God's people were supposed to be taking notice of all this and interpreting Bible prophecy with the help of the Holy Spirit. Well, this is exactly what Jesus was doing. As we watch him for three and a half years in the Gospels, he was acting out Daniel's 70th week. He was acting out the pre-trib rapture of the bride, the mid-trib rapture of the church, the government of God. And then he was acting out the remnant being gathered in one place and they're all sick and downcast and, and ill and they have no man to help them. And then he was going to heal them. How is he going to heal them? Oh, through the glorified, raptured church. They're going to come down, stir up the waters, get their hearts thinking about the scriptures, get them seeking God, and then the glorified church will have the power and authority in their spirits. 
incognito, of course. They'll be like angels, Luke chapter 20, verse 36, and they'll heal the sick. So we see Jesus doing what Ezekiel was doing, acting out Bible prophecy. So anybody who is teaching Bible prophecy, you can test their accuracy. Are they cluing into this? Do they even know how they're supposed to be arriving at accurate Bible interpretations for all these prophecies? If they're not watching Jesus and explaining to you what Jesus was doing, how this fits into God's timeline, their interpretations are not going to be accurate. We see a lot of Bible prophecy teachers trying to assemble a timeline, if they'll even show you a timeline. And if they do, you'll be able to notice, are they using their intellect, human reasoning to kind of fit things together the way they see it? Or are they watching Jesus? Are they using what they see Jesus doing and saying at certain times? We see that the man ill for 38 years, this was on a Sabbath during the Feast of the Jews. So that is cluing us in to a timing. Okay, as you can see, we're trying to help you be taught by the Holy Spirit so that you don't even need us. So if the internet goes down, so if YouTube platform is removed and all you have is the Bible and a concordance, you can sit with the Lord and you can be receiving all these amazing treasures from the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for listening and I'll catch you in the next video. Bye.